Welcome back to the 14th part of the study of the Song of Solomon. Today, my dear friends, may we start with chapter 4, verse 9. Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and verse 9. The bridegroom talks, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. My dear friends, what is the meaning of this verse? If you look at it in a literal sense, it doesn't mean a thing except that the man is apparently attracted by this girl and perhaps she's winking because one eye and her necklace has one pendant. But if you go deep into understanding the metaphorical meaning, it has some interesting elements embedded within this uh, verse. The bridegroom calls this girl, my sister, my spouse. Why? Well, in one sense, we are siblings of Jesus because we all have the same heavenly father. Okay? So Jesus can call us his sibling, not a male sibling, although we can be brothers because we are co-heirs with Jesus. But then, we are females when it comes to Jesus because we are the bride. So it is okay for Jesus, the bridegroom, to call us my sister, my spouse. Also, my dear friends, it was the law given through Moses which forbade siblings getting married to each other. Prior to that, in fact, many people wonder where Cain got his wife from. She was none other than another daughter of Adam and Eve. Now, what about Abraham? If you look at Genesis chapter 20, verses 11 and 12, he says to King Abimelech, well, it is not all that of a lie when I said, this is my sister, because her father is my father. We are half siblings. So, Sarah was a half sister to Abraham. But then later on, the law was given through Moses. After that, even half-siblings cannot get married. So that is not allowed now, my dear friends. But with Jesus, we are, we are brothers with Jesus. Now, th there, are, there are five Greek words to denote children in, in the Bible. Brephos, Paideia, Napios, Technon, and Huios. And the word Huios means the, 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 the son who is an heir. And Jesus is the son of God uh, he is who you to Theo. Those of you who know Greek, you know what I'm talking about. And when we are adopted into God's family by God, we are also huyoi, or which is the plural of huyos. Uh, so Jesus can call us his brothers, but then he also can call us his sisters because we are his bride. Now, there is no male and female differences in the kingdom of God, my dear friends. So, feminists have messed everything up. Uh, well, you know, when God created male and female, he did not create the females in any inferior way than man. No, 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 no. Females are not at all inferior to male. And look, this is coming from a male. So, ladies, be happy. A guy is telling you, that you are not at all inferior in anything. Well, you may ask, why then does the Bible say in some places, at least in two places in the New Testament, that the women are the weaker vessel? Hey, that's physical. God has created them physically weaker, not, not to be weak, but for the stronger man to take care look after, nourish and cherish the weaker wife that God is giving to the husband. It's a nice thing, not a negative thing. But, but unfortunately, male chauvinism has been evident in the world in many cultures and in their own little ways, males want to be the dominant person. And even sadly, 
Christian men, many Christian men try to overpower the wife saying, look, I am the head and all that kind of nonsense. Of course, who said otherwise, the husband is the head. I am the head. Why? I need to understand my body. I need to take care of my body. I need to love my body. So my wife has been created dependent uh, on me, not for me to be the boss, but to love her, to cherish her, to nurture her, which is a wonderful thing, my dear friends. Uh, many people have messed this whole thing up. But you know, when, you, when we talk about the kingdom of God, there is no male or female. I'll tell you why. Even the women are sons of God in the huyos sense of the word. But then, you know, in a loving manner, uh, the, the ladies can be daughters of God. Fine, because even though the word brephos in Greek, which is in masculine, the brephos child also could be a female child. Then uh, paedia. Paedia is feminine gender. But, you know, you also can be a male child who is a paedia. Then you, you get the napios, which again is masculine. But then, you know, napios could be a female child as well. What about technon, which is in neuter gender? Technon, even I am a technon of my parents. You, however old you are, you, you may be a male, you may be a female, but you are a technon to your parents. You are a child to your parents. But the fifth word, huyos, is strictly masculine. Because according to theology and according to Pauline theology, the word huyos is used to denote that God has adopted us, not just as any child into the family, but according to the Roman system of adoption, to become heirs with the real son, the only begotten son, Jesus. So we are co-heirs with Jesus in a masculine sense. So my dear ladies, sisters, mothers, you are all males. You are all sons of God the Father. But don't worry, guys like us, we are the bride of Christ. Tip for tat. If you are not happy to be called sons of God, ladies, then I have all the rights to be sad to be called the bride of Christ. Now if you, like, like, like that crazy woman, Rosemary Rutford Ruther, uh, you know, the, the great feminist, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> if you want to be like that and say, well, I am a son, we are sons and daughters to the father, well, you know, then we can say we are brides or bridegrooms of Christ. Then, then, then that takes us to a naughty area. Okay, so no, 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 Jesus has only bride. He has a bride which is feminine and I am a bride of Christ with a moustache. Okay, so ladies, you can be sons of God, heirs of God, even though you are ladies. In actual fact, there is no gender difference in the kingdom of God. Now that's what I'm trying to say here. Anyway, that's not within the scope of our study. Here, Jesus can call us my sister. <clears throat> because we have the same Abba Hashemayim, we have the same Heavenly Father. Okay? Uh, I, I mean, look at this. Perhaps Jesus is talking to us like the way Abraham is talking to Sarah. Mm. In the New Testament at uh, one point, I don't remember the verse, but then, you know, you can find it out. This girl, Sarah, is said to have called or addressed Abraham as Lord. Okay? What a wonderful symbolism. In that case, Jesus can call us my sister, my spouse, just the way Abraham could call Sarah, my sister, my spouse. Wow. Interesting, eh? Anyway, what is this one eye business and, and uh, one chain of thy neck business? Well, I, I really went deep into analyzing what is this one eye thing. Uh, well, I, I, I have come out with two explanations. Now, if you uh, have another explanation, wonderful. 
and try to let me know also because I want to learn things that I don't know. But let me share my thoughts also, okay? Now, in our culture, in our Tamil culture, Sri Lankan Indian culture, a lot of marriages are still arranged marriages. And I know many of you don't understand the concept, you don't like the concept. I mean, frankly speaking, even I am not all that for it. You know, I, 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 I am sorry, I, I am a little bit uh, worried. I mean, I, it's kind of bizarre to me how you you get married to somebody who you don't know. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, this girl has become your wife and you have to start living your life in every sense of the word with somebody you, you are not really acquainted with. Uh, anyway, let's, let's leave that aside. The bridegroom with all his family members would go one day to check it out and arrange this proposal to the bride's home. It is an interesting function, okay? So they'll have all these eatables, they have all these visitors, relatives present, and it's an interesting, solemn sort of a moment. And uh, this bridegroom would be coming and he would try to locate the bride. Of course, after all, this is his moment. And he wants to see who is this girl who is going to become my wife? So he would be looking, he would see the children running up and down, uh, women coming with all these eatables and drinks, serving people going. And he would be trying to, you know, in the midst of all the discussion going on, this bridegroom would be uh, trying to see who could be the girl, where is this girl? And then all of a sudden, from behind a door or a window, a, a, a little peep happens. Somebody peeps out. And then half of that face, you know, one eye comes out. And boy, this guy gets so excited. Aha, that must be the girl. And you know, I mean, I, I, I'm talking like a boy here, okay? I'm talking like a guy here. Guys know what I'm talking about. You know, when we see half the face of a girl, we could be more attracted to that face than looking at the full face. Hey, does that mean sense to you? True, isn't it? Now, that, that, that one eye thing, hey, is that why that winking came? You know, winking was those days when I was a little kid, always associated to romance. In Sri Lanka, you know, if you wink, that means I love you, I'm attracted to you, thing. I don't know how it is now, it's all different now. But I don't know. Anyway, that is one. Perhaps this bridegroom also refers to something like that. Why? Because in a Jewish cultural setting, Arranged marriages were done those days. Who arranged the marriages? Usually the father of the bridegroom. Anyway, in our case also, my dear friends, it's the heavenly father who chose the church, the bride for his only begotten son. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is preparing the bride for the bridegroom. Interesting things are there. That could be one. But then there could be another spiritual side to it. What about our physical eyes versus our spiritual eyes? If you take our physical eyes as one and spiritual eyes as one, we see Jesus not with our physical eyes but our spiritual eyes. Perhaps Jesus is referring to that. He's saying, I'm already attracted to you because you already look at me through your spiritual eyes. Now, I believe this is very true. Now, on the one hand, I don't dismiss the idea altogether that some people have seen Jesus. But I am a staunch believer in believing that nobody has seen Jesus in his fullest glory. Remember John, who once upon a time reclined on the side of Jesus. When he saw Jesus in Revelation 1, he fell at his feet as though dead. 
And if we see Jesus in his fullest glory, I think we, we will fall dead. Jesus is too huge for my small eyes to see. Uh, so I, I, I don't believe that we can see Jesus in his fullest glory. Now many of you may say, claim that you have seen Jesus. Great, wonderful. Even I say that I, I saw Jesus once when I was in France in I mean, many, many years ago. Yes, I saw Jesus. But when we see Jesus, he doesn't appear in his fullest glory. He has to reduce his glory to the level where our physical eyes can see him. But even that is so uh, great, you know, you cannot bear it. You know, the day I saw Jesus, I, I, I was shocked to smithereens. I was flabbergasted. I fell on my knees. It was in a church right before I got to preach. And I said, Lord, please, please take this vision away. I don't, I don't want to see you because it was so, um, it was so solemn. It was so majestic. I could not bear. I started shivering. And, and I continued shivering for one week. And whoever I came into physical contact with fell just like that. On that day, I mean, this is true, so nobody can deny in that church in France, when I, when I started preaching, hundreds of people, the entire church fell. They all fell on the floor. I thought some people just died. Uh, anyway, let's not get into those things. You know, I don't advertise things that happen in my meetings at all. I mean, you can, if you are a, a watcher of my YouTube programs and my uh, television programs, I, I don't telecast those things. I tell them to... Uh, switch the cameras off. Why? All glory should go to God. I am just a deliverer of God's message under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's all. That's where my responsibility ends. Anyway, I continued to shiver for one week. I was driving, but I was trembling. I was trembling as if I was in a fritzy cold. Okay, I was trembling, I was shivering, and my wife was always with me, and she could not touch me. She, was, she didn't know what was happening to me. And then one week later, my physical condition worsened to the extent where they had to take me to the intensive care unit of the hospital, admit me, and I was treated. I was treated for shock. They did not know anything. I mean, they, they examined me and said, you are fine. But then we don't know why you are trembling, why you are panicking. And uh, friends, some of you know that I'm a psychologist. So I know that uh, I didn't have any depression. I didn't have any bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Uh, and I was not suffering from any PTSD as such. But, but no, no, I'll take it back. I will take it back. It could well be a PTSD. Why? The, the vision that I saw of Jesus was so traumatic. It was nice, lovely. But for my human, my, my, my physicality, it was so traumatic. And I was suffering from a, a, a funny, inexplicable, uh, incomprehensible trauma and a post-traumatic stress for which I was treated. So I, I, I know what it is to see Jesus even in, in that reduced form of, form of his glory. Huh. Can we see him in his fullest glory? Finito. We will explode. It will be like little boy or fat man. You know what little boy and fat man were, right? The, the, the <clears throat> nuclear bombs that were thrown on, onto Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. They were respectively called little boy and fat man. You know, it's like little boy and fat man exploding inside of us together. <laughs> Oh, Jesus is so majestic. But, praise God, we are going to see him in his fullest glory. When the rapture happens, we will see him. We will not only see Jesus, we will see the Father, we will see the Holy Spirit in their fullest glory. We will see all the angels, we see the heaven. And uh, wow, we are going to live there eternally. So I'm not in a hurry to see him with my physical eyes. But, but then we are, we are seeing him with our Spiritualize, don't we? And um, 
So perhaps that's what Jesus is saying here because we know that the bridegroom here is Jesus and he is saying here with your one eye you have attracted me girl. So perhaps with the spiritual eye that we see him, we have attracted him. What about the one single necklace? Where, where does the chain of thy neck? Of course the chain is worn on the neck but then the pendant comes to the heart area. Remember in one of our foregone episodes, we discussed about the, the frankincense that she's wearing between her breasts. You know, I said there is nothing sexual in that, but it talks about the heart. So perhaps this is the heart that he's talking about. The heart in which you have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So the church, you and I, we see Jesus with our spiritual eyes and we have faith in him. Amen to that. What about Hebrews 11? 1. Faith is the substance of things that are not seen. Okay? So we believe the unseen Jesus. We see him only with our spiritual eyes. And we have that faith on him. So this spiritual eye and the faith has a have attracted our bridegroom to us. And perhaps that's why he's saying in verse 10, How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. Hey, remember the word fair? I told you it corresponds to the color white, which means holiness and righteousness. Remember that. So he's continuing to, continuing to say, How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine? Now we have Coca-Cola, Fanta, Sprite, Pepsi-Cola, 7-Up and Mountain Dew, ginger beer, ginger ale, what not. And then intoxicants, semi-intoxicants, beer, wine, red wine, white wine, vino, rosso, vino blanco, champagne and you, know, you can go all the way to vodka uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Scottish whiskey, okay. But... In the biblical days, they only had wine besides water as their interesting drink. So, in any context, wine is wine. It's wonderful. But then the bridegroom says, how much better is thy love than wine? Look, I'm not here to discuss whether you can drink wine or not. Uh, my personal opinion is that no, refrain from anything alcoholic, okay? Irrespective of the percentage of alcohol they are in. Anyway, let's not talk about that because my friends from Europe may disagree with me. Uh, that's okay. And the smell of thine ointments, then all spices. Here, remember in a foregone episode, I explained that spices and ointment, they talk about sacrifices. So perhaps the bridegroom is saying, yes, there are the five types of the Old Testament offerings, Okay, uh, and there are sac sacrifices. I enjoy your sacrifice. There are two kinds of sacrifices that we are offering unto God. There are many, but two very interesting ones. One, our praises and thanks, which are the offerings of our lips. And then Romans 12, 1 says that we have offered our body as the living sacrifice to Jesus. And he is seen here saying to the church, I enjoy your sacrifices of your body and your praise and worship to me than all the five Old Testament offerings and those that preceded the Mosaic Old Testament offerings, such as the ones that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob offered and people like Job offered and Noah offered. Okay, so this is... Verse 10. So I, I, I think these verses 9 and 10 are interesting. Uh, and, and in our next episode, I'll, I'll take you all the way from verse 11 to 16. And uh, I think uh, you're enjoying our series. Hey, enjoy being the bride of this wonderful bridegroom, Jesus. See you soon. <laughs>